Hello, everyone. Good morning. So it looks like we are live. Uh, let me share the slides. All right. So welcome to the sixth lecture. Uh, we call it Sneaky Snake, uh, which is uh, one of the last uh, pre-alignment filters that we are going to explain. We may have one more on Grim filter. And after that, we will move with uh, different topics uh, with my colleagues. I think we'll have four lectures more. And uh, hopefully by that, we cover different aspects of genome analysis, or at least focusing on the hardware accelerations plus uh, new algorithms that develop uh, by us. Um, so as a reminder, I remember all the course materials are already public online on YouTube and on the course web page. You can access using this link. You'll see the slides in both in both uh, formats, PDF and PPTX. And um, we will continue now with uh, pre-alignment filter, which we already explained uh, three more uh, filters, uh, gatekeeper, magnet, and uh, shuji. So remember this from the previous three lectures, that sequence alignment is still expensive, even uh, until today. So our goal is to accelerate read mapping by reducing the need for dynamic programming algorithms. What does that mean? We first want to have this observation that genomic sequences either similar to each other or dissimilar to each other. And if they are dissimilar, they are probably not interesting to us. It uh, depends on really the application, the parameters, how, to, how you really define similar or dissimilar sequences. As we said multiple times, uh, if your edit distance threshold is five and then the number of edits between any two sequences is six or seven, then that is what we call dissimilar sequence. And in this case, we really don't care about the type or the location of these edits whether they are substitutions, deletions, or insertion. We just ignore them. If they are similar, we want to find this, uh, the exact location of each edit operation that we recorded in what we call a cigar string. A cigar string is a representation of the number and the location of this edit operation. If uh, calculating the dissimilar sequences, always expensive. Why? because we always going to trash whatever computation we did. So it's always better to perform the minimal number of computation needed just to identify whether this is dissimilar or similar. If it's similar, there is, no, um, and there is no way to escape the computation needed for that, because anyway, we need the optimal number of edits, the uh, exact type of, uh, type of edit, and the location of these edits. So the main idea of all these pre-alignment filtering is to do some kind of indexing first, where you can um, get some seeds or subsequences from the read and try to match them with the subsequences extracted from the reference genome. And because the reference genome is only one and fixed most of the time, most of the runtime, so we normally store them in, in a hash table or any kind of indexing. Could be Bohr's Wheeler transformation or something else. From the read, the read are something uh, as input uh, coming by the user. So every time we run the tool, we probably have different read set. And that's why we don't store them in hash table. So we just extract seeds from the read, try to query them in the hash table, and then try to find the location that share enough number of seeds. Once we identify these locations that has a pool of seeds around them uh, above a threshold, we can set a threshold for example, five seeds, nearby seeds. If we have five nearby or more seeds, then we need to do sequence alignment or dynamic programming algorithm. But as we said, we really want to use the minimal computation at this stage just to identify the dissimilar sequences first, and then we can proceed with the dynamic programming algorithm. And we said, whatever filter you develop, they should satisfy these three conditions. First, filter out most of incorrect mapping. And we said why we say most of, but not all of them. Uh, if you still remember, maybe you can write in the chat the reason for that, or you can uh, enable the mic. People on YouTube 
can also participate, write in the chat box why we filter out most of incorrect mappings, but not all of them. Let's wait a bit until we get some answers in the Zoom chat or YouTube. Why we filter out most of incorrect mappings, but not all of them. Going once, get an answer. Filtering out all of them is too expensive. Why it's too expensive? Maybe someone who can develop very smart filtering algorithm that can remove all of them using some cheap computation. Is it possible? Think about sequence alignment. If we use something similar to sequence alignment to do the filtering here, what will happen? Someone developed something very regress, very smart, that can detect these dissimilar sequences and delete them. So just keep this question in mind. We have a slide toward the end of the lecture and that hopefully answer all these questions. All right, thanks Richard. So the, the second properties that we need to maintain is preserving all correct mappings. And this is obvious, right? Um, what's the goal of deleting the similar sequences? We will lose the, the idea behind developing read mapper, right? So we really need to maintain all of them. The third one is do it quickly. Why is that? Because this is the main goal actually behind filtering. So we want to filter the dissimilar so that we have a minimal workload for the sequence line. So the dynamic programming algorithm will be only operating over the similar sequences. So for sneaky snake, we make a key observation based on this plot, which we call it dot plot. This is not proposed by us. This is a very old method to represent similarities between very long sequences. And it was proposed in 1985. Uh, what is it actually? This is a table. This is an entire table. Um, this is software. Yeah, my camera is disconnected. Yeah, let me try to solve it quickly. Almost there. doesn't want. All right, so let's switch to the old camera, the laptop camera. Okay, yeah. So hopefully you still can see the slides. Yes, we can see the slides. Great, thanks to all. Okay, so what is this dot plot or dot matrix? So basically this is a table, really a table, and each dot represents a single entry or a single cell. 
single uh, entry in this table. And what we have here in the x-axis is one of the genomes. Uh, each uh, uh, entry represents a location. Uh, so this is location one, for example, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, until then. The y-axis is another sequence that we are comparing with. So we are comparing this sequence to that sequence. Whenever we observe an exact match with the corresponding um, base or character from the other sequence, we represent it as a dot. Now, whether we represent it as a red or blue dot, that's another question. We don't care at this point. But what is important to us is that whenever we have similar sequences, we observe that most of these dots are scattered around the diagonal. So you can see here, this is the main diagonal, and most of the dots are scattered around there so that we have um, connected lines between these dots. Remember, this is different from dynamic programming. We don't have any dependencies. So this is just like Hamming distance. Whenever we have, we compare, for example, the first character over there with all characters from the other sequence. Whenever we have exact match, just place a dot over there. There's no dependencies at all. Now, we, uh, we leverage this observation or we exploit it actually to do sneaky snake algorithm. So the correct alignment is a sequence of non-overlapping long matches. And these are the non-overlapping long matches, which are the things around the diagonal. So we said, OK, so let's approximate at a distance calculation using what we call single net routing problem in VLSI chip. We observe that also in single net routing problem is something very similar to connecting these dots or finding these uh, dots or long non-overlapping matches. How is that? So this is the VLSI chip, which uh, exists in any kind of electronics in your phone, in your laptop, and so on. So if you dissect this chip, you will see something like this. So these are the pins or the legs of this chip, and you'll see some components from inside. Uh, the goal as, um, as electrical engineer or um, uh, chip designer, you have some components here and you want to connect one of these pin to the other pin in the other side while connecting some of these components inside using shortest path. Now, shortest path or, short or the lowest coast uh, has multiple definitions. It could be the lowest latency, the minimum energy consumption, or the, the least routing cost, for example, because this um, routing path, you pay cost for them, right? And you don't want to increase the, their number because they're going to increase the energy or taking space because they will collide with those modules. So your goal is to find the shortest path from one point to another point while connecting some of these components or avoiding these components. It depends on your design um, schema. So that is for single net routing problem. Now, how we, how we solve it in reality. So in the, in the paper, in Sneak Snake paper, we show the exact equation to build this, what we call a, 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 a chip maze. And this chip maze, we calculate a binary matrix or a binary table using this uh, equation. You can see the equation is very simple. So you just need to track the I and J indices. And then you either uh, solve or uh, fill or calculate the entry as zero or one. So for example, here, um, J and J, it's really the corresponding characters from both sequences. If they are similar to each other, you just place a zero, otherwise a one. And then you, you, you shift one of the sequences, which is Q. You try to get a different indices over there and you compare it with J from R and so on. You continue doing that until you calculate everything. Now, how many columns? As long as we have in the sequence. So how many characters we have in any of the sequences, then that is the number for the columns of the chip maze. Now, what is the number of rows? Is two E plus one. What is E? At a distant threshold. So two E plus one. And here we define E as three, then we have seven rows. So seven rows times 12 columns. Anyway, assume we have this matrix, this binary matrix. Now we want to convert it into a, um, a VLSI chip. So we want to visualize this as if it is a chip. How is that? 
So simply convert each one into a black box, each zero into a white box, as you can see. Just each one, think about it as a module in the VLSI chip, and the zero as available path where you can detour or place your routing path over there. Okay, hopefully this is clear. Now, once you have the VLSI chip, your goal is to go from here, from the left side to the right side um, by um, maintaining or preserving the characteristics you have, whether it's the shortest path, the lowest coast, and so on. We define this as the shortest path with minimal number of edits. So we want to go from left side to the right side while maintaining the number of edits or obstacles or modules that we can avoid uh, up to three, up to E edits. So equal or less than three. So how we solve it? It's very similar to single net routing problem. In each row, you detect how many steps you can go further. So you find here zero steps because you start with an obstacle or a module, then you cannot pass. So here you cannot, you cannot. Here you can move four steps forward because your goal is always to go from left to the right. So you want to go as far as possible in each row. That is a greedy choice to get with the shortest path because if there is no obstacles at all, then you just walk in a single row and that's it. You solve the problem. Now you keep continue calculating until you ensure that you find the path with the longest distance or the largest uh, path we have over there, which is the one in the middle. It has four steps to walk forward and the others have less than four. Now, if we have four uh, somewhere in another row, that's fine. That is a tie. And how to break the tie? Just choose any one of them, as simple as that. Now, once we move four steps forward, we face an obstacle over there. So to move forward and solve another sub problem, we need to reduce the three obstacles over there allowed to us by one. So now we reduce it and it becomes only two. So only we can avoid two or less uh, obstacles. And now we repeat the exact same steps, but we start calculating from the next column. We don't start from the column where we stop or where we have the obstacle, but we move to the next column. And we find the rows, uh, this is zero, zero, and this is four steps forward, zero, two, zero, zero. So which one we choose? We always choose with a greedy choice, the one with the largest number of available steps, which is four. So we choose four, we face an obstacle over there, and then we reduce the number of obstacles we have from two to one. And now we repeat starting from this column, not that column, not where we stopped, but the next one, as I said. Now we keep calculating each row. And in this case, you can see that we find three paths with the exact same number of available steps. So all of them has single step to move forward. Which one we choose? As I said, this is a tie. And to break the tie, we need to choose any one of them. It doesn't really matter. Now, some of you could say, how come it doesn't matter? Uh, because if I choose one far from this path, I'm going to use a vertical path as well. And that is a coast for the silicon or for the metal layer in the VLSI chip, right? So because we have multiple layers stacked on top of each other, uh, to have vertical and horizontal lines or connections. And then soldering these layers far from each other or this connection might give you some cost, right? Because you are going to occupy this entire vertical connection over there. Now, for us, we define the problem that we don't want to find the optimal number of edits, but we want to find something that give you insights about the number of edits. We really don't care if the exact number of edits is five or six or seven. As we always say in filtering, we want something to tell us whether the number of edits is above a threshold or lower than a threshold, right? So we don't care if it's seven, eight, nine, and so on. As long as it's above five, then done. That means these are dissimilar. 
uh, if we are really interested in finding the exact number of edits, then we are going to use uh, sequence alignment or dynamic programming anyway. So in the next step, we are going to use the dynamic program. And for that, at this stage, we try to simplify the computation so that we don't have any dependencies at all. We don't want to measure the distance from this connection to the next connection, for example, because that going to cause some problems, especially that you may have something closer to the path, but not with the largest number of steps, for example. Then you need to check the distance first and then come back and check the uh, vertical distance between these paths. All right, uh, so finally we find the, the, the last path that can send us to the exit while we uh, maintain the number of available steps or obstacles that we can avoid. Uh, since we face an obstacle over there towards the end, we're going to reduce the number of available obstacles from one to zero. So since we reach zero or more steps while we reach the end, then that means these two sequences used to build this table or binary table or chip maze, they are already similar, right? So once we terminate sneak snake, then if they are similar, we directly call dynamic programming algorithm, which can be Smith-Waterman, needleman Wunsch, KSW2, wavefront algorithm, and so on. Now think about when we calculate the first step, we said we have an obstacle over there, right? In the very first row, very first cell, we have an obstacle. So once we face an obstacle, we directly go to the next row and we keep calculating, right? So this is exactly what we need to calculate, not the full matrix, but actually this. So I trick you by saying that we need to use that equation to build the matrix first, but in reality, we build everything on the fly. So while we are moving, we calculate row by row. So we go to that cell, we use our equation to calculate it. If there's an obstacle, we terminate that row directly. And then we move to the next row, and then to the third row and so on. So thinking about very long sequences, you can see the amount of computation we save by not calculating most of the matrix. So it really depends on the two sequences, but on average, we don't calculate most of the entries over there because there's always a solution if this is similar sequences and the solution is to find a path. So only that path and some alternatives path will be calculated. Other than that, you will always have an obstacle in the beginning and then you won't calculate most of it until uh, you find the next checkpoint. These checkpoints, we don't know them in advance either. So we only know the checkpoint one but after that, we need to really to calculate each row until we got the second checkpoint and uh, so forth. And so you can think about how fast this algorithm can be compared to uh, dynamic programming algorithms, even in, in C uh, implementation or Python or whatever. So we implement this on GPU, FPGA, and CPU. And this is these the results for FPGA resources. So this is the number of lookup tables needed. You can see most of the cases is less than one or less than 2% uh, at most. And that is very cheap uh, algorithm to be implemented in FPGAs. And since it's very lightweight uh, with the, um, very low footprint or resources footprint, then you can uh, use a lot of, uh, or large number of replications. So you can, instead of solving single uh, problem, you can have uh, 50 problems, for example, or 100 problems if the utilization is less than 1%. It really depends on the edit distance threshold. Why is that? Because for five edit distance threshold, for example, how many rows you are going to build? Remember, we said there is an equation for the number of rows. Right? The number of columns is equivalent to the sequence length. If we have a million long sequences, then we need million columns. But the number of rows depends on the edit distance threshold, which is 2e plus 1. So if we have 5, then we have 11 rows. That is more computation than uh, edit distance threshold of 2, for example. Um, however, uh, since we were using um, an outdated connection in that time with uh, PCI Express uh, 3, uh, I think we couldn't move uh, to, uh, many of the data 
to the FPGA to be processed with a single cycle. So we are able to saturate the memory bandwidth using only 16 module, but we could fit more if uh, we use uh, more sophisticated uh, connections between the uh, CPU host and the FPGA. These days we have higher memory bandwidth. You can accommodate the data in the memory and then of the FPGA and then move them to the FPGA or to the logic to, be, to do the calculation. And this is what we exploit in the next uh, paper. Now, remember, going back to the question I asked earlier, uh, why we cannot remove all incorrect mapping or all dissimilar sequences. Now, this is um, a plot that has too many information, so I really need your focus over here. Um, now, in the x-axis, we have information on the filtering. So the first row, we have the rejection ratio of the filter. So the 100% means um, uh, the, the, the ratio of the rejection. So how many uh, or the portion or the percentage of the input mappings or the pairs get rejected by the filter. So we have 100% uh, all the way to 20%. The second row is the speed the speed of the filtering compared to the sequence alignment. So if the filter is 2x faster than the, uh, the alignment, or 4x or 8x, and so on. So we have 8x, 16x, 32x, and so on. Now the green line, or the y-axis first, is the processing time for 1 million mappings. So for example, at this point, we have 10,000 million, uh, no, 10,000 seconds for 1 million uh, pairs, right? So now assume we have the sequence alignment. We want to process this 10,000 or this 1 million sequences. So we run sequence alignment and take assume constant time for whatever the pair is. And then we will take always 10,000 seconds to process these 1 million mappings. Now we want to measure the time for filtering plus alignment, giving that these characteristics are satisfied. For example, if we say 100%, then 100% of the pairs are rejected. So this is what we get, really a zigzag shape plot. What does it say? So focus at this point, for example. Now, if the filter rejects everything, everything, totally everything. So 1 million pairs get rejected. What does that mean? It means we have zero time for the alignment because there is nothing coming out of the filter. And the only time we will uh, calculate over here is the filtering. So the filtering time uh, will be accounted for because the only thing operating is the filter. And the filter is 2x faster than the alignment. So that's why the runtime over here is around 5,000 seconds, which is half of the alignment. Now, as long as we reduce the rejection rate, the filtering time start to dominate and even being slower than uh, sequence alignment alone. So if we reject only 20% of the uh, pairs over here in the peak, only 20% gets rejected and 80% of the pairs go to the alignment, then what, what will be the, uh, the execution time, the total execution time? So again, we will have the uh, execution time for the filtering for the entire number of pairs or the entire data set, which is 1 million pair. And remember, the filter is 2x faster than the aligner. And then we need 5,000 seconds just for filtering plus whatever the execution time for the aligner for the 80% of the pairs. And this way, we are increasing the execution time because we add an overhead for the filtering and we reject only a minimal uh, number of pairs. Likewise, you can think about it exactly the same for other data set or other conditions. For example, here, we delete 100% of the pairs and the filter is 16 times faster, then the execution time will drop from here, from the 10,000 seconds, all the way to maybe, I don't know, 200 seconds, around 500 maybe, right? And that will be the execution time. 
So the speed up we expected from integrating pre-alignment filtering with the alignment is really depends on the data itself and how fast the filter is. Our goal is always to be in this area, to be as far as possible from the execution time of the uh, aligner uh, or the sequence aligner we use, right? So we want always to be in this area. That is to say, we want to reject most of the pairs and have the fastest performance possible out of the filter. Now back to the question, why we cannot reject all incorrect mappings. Think about the optimality. So if we really have such optimal algorithm, like this algorithm is very smart, can know all the incorrect mappings, then there is no way to be a filter that is should be a sequence aligner. If an algorithm can reject all dissimilar sequences, it means the alg algorithm is optimal, right? It might not be optimal in uh, finding the location of the edits or the number of edits, but at least should be optimal in detecting these number of edits above a threshold or lower than a threshold and should guess it right. And in such optimal algorithm, it's hard to believe that you have an optimal algorithm that performs uh, faster than uh, the sequence aligner. Uh, that is in general case. You may uh, focus on special cases where you have, for example, some of the scoring or some of the parameters. You can focus on them and tweak the algorithm for these uh, scores, and then you might get a faster performance than a typical or general purpose sequence aligner. But still, uh, if you get an optimal performance, then what is the point of using filtering? If you can have such optimal algorithm to detect the dissimilar sequences. So that's why we don't aim to do filtering for all incorrect mappings, but we want uh, the, the, largest, uh, the largest portion of the rejection rate. That's why this gray area, the shade over here, it's not touching the 100%, because this is really um, ideal case or the optimal, very optimal, very uh, optimistic uh, case. But we aim to have something like 90% or so, something around that. Hopefully by that, um, I give you a clear idea on the benefits of pre-alignment filtering. So uh, getting information on the filter itself is not enough. You really need to check the, uh, the number of accepted pairs and then compare the, the runtime of the filter with the sequence aligner and see how both together, integrated together, perform. So pre-alignment saves more than 40% to 80% of the total processing times. Of course, that depends on the data you use. All right, so giving that you already see Gatekeeper, Shuji, Magnet, and now Sneaky Snake, so you can, give, you can get a clear idea on the accuracy, hopefully. So in Sneaky Snake, we don't have any dependencies. We don't have a domination with the zeros as we have in Gatekeeper and Magnet as well. So you can see Sneaky Snake performs the best, even better than Magnet. So you can see the black, uh, the black plot over there. This is Sneaky Snake. And the green one is Magnet, the light green. The dark green over here uh, is SSD. Then Gatekeeper overlaps with that. Uh, you can see, for example, Gatekeeper at, at a distance at threshold 9 or 10. They don't reject anything. So they accept basically everything. So they have false accept rate of uh, 100% and uh, Shuji somewhere in the middle. But they still all performs very well up to 5%, which is the typical used at a distance threshold. So we normally use somewhere around 5% of the sequence length. OK, so back to the previous slide where we motivate you to always measure the uh, runtime end to end, filtering plus alignment together. We did this experiment with one of the fastest or one of the best optimal sequence aligner that does not sacrifice anything called per sale. And there is no heuristics, for example, used over there. And that's why it's really expensive algorithm. In the, in the yellow plots or yellow columns, you will see the performance or the execution time of sneak snake only, the filtering. And in the gray 
columns, you'll see parasail. Just running sneak sneak alone and run parasail alone, you'll get these plots. And now, if you go to sneaky snake, you get the accepted pairs, and you try to run parasail on only the accepted pairs, you'll On. How about now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I think yes. Uh, the headset turned on, so the voice transferred to the other device. All right. So, yeah, as I said, the yellow is sneak snake only, the gray is parasail, and the green is parasail uh, operating over the accepted pairs by sneak snake. And you can see, um, uh, it depends on the data, but it looks like most of the data uh, having edits more than 700, uh, because here, per sale, uh, barely operate on anything. But after that, you start to see some execution time for per sale after sneaky snake, which are the green bars. It means there are some pairs accepted by sneaky snake. That's why we see some execution time. And you can see the speed up, we observe it, all the way up to 1,250 of edit distance threshold. And when we use, this is for 10,000 long sequences, and this is for 100,000 long sequences. You can see in the 100K, uh, the speed up is observed up to 11,000 uh, of edit distance threshold. And this edit distance threshold really high, especially for hi-fi reads, for example which are very accurate. Even for ONT, the, this threshold is really high, set really high, because uh, recently the error threshold or the descent threshold should be somewhere between 5% or 2% to 5%, especially with the R10 chemistry we have in uh, nanopore devices. That is for Paracel. Now, if we move to the fastest alternative, which is KSW2, to use a lot of heuristics, for example, Z-drop, and many more with the SIMD vectorization and so on. So we can see the speed up is um, somewhere around the same ratios, but the, uh, the speed up ratio itself is less than what we observe from Perseil because now the sequence aligner is faster than Perseil, but Sneak Snake still the same performance. So you can see here, we have a huge speed up when most of the things get rejected by the filter. So you can see at, at a distance threshold one, most of the pairs are rejected and that is around 100% of them. Now, if we move to 31, we may have some pairs accepted and so on. You can track it with the uh, red plot. You can see when we have a rejection or acceptance actually. So at here, we have 10% of the pairs get accepted and here 50% or 45, all the way to 90%. So we observe whenever we accept up to 70%, which is really high, if we accept 70% of the pairs, that's really something high. And then we observe almost the same performance as KSW2. So it really depends on what kind of filtering or what kind of indexing you use before, how many seeds you extracted, and so on. All of these will play with the number of edits you have in the pairs, especially in the read mapper. If you extract a lot of seeds from the read, then that going to um, let you suffer by querying the hash table multiple times and always accessing the index can be expensive because it cannot fit in the cache. So you need to go to the main memory most of the time, uh, get the query or does it exist, does not exist and come back to the CPU and then start the processing. So either you want to suffer in, during the indexing or during the filtering. That is uh, your choice. Hopefully by that, we cover most of the things about Sneak Snake. We observe uh, up to four orders of magnitude more accuracy than Shuji and Gatekeeper. And then we accelerate Idlib, which is uh, one of the best or the best performing implementation of Myers but Vector. Uh, they have a lot of configurations for local, uh, G local and um, um, uh, global alignment. And they have also uh, two configuration for um, 
for the path and without path, that is to say with generating the cigar and without generating the cigar, but Idlib is calculating only at a distance at the end or Levenstein uh, distance. For Paracel, just do the full sequence aligner. And these are the speed up numbers using, as I said, we implement it on FPGA, GPUs, and CPUs. However, since we use all these accelerators, we need still to move the data from the host CPU or the host memory all the way to the FPGA or the GPU. So we need to move the data from there to the memory of the, these cards, and then we start processing. And we will need to alleviate data movement bottleneck. We know that data movement is always expensive because they use uh, uh, power hungry buses uh, over PCI Express, for example, or something else. Uh, that will cost you a lot in terms of energy. You could overlap the data transfer time and by doing a lot of computation while you are transferring the data, but that's still not solving the issue with the energy. And that's why we need to design mapping and filtering algorithms that felt fit processing in memory. So this is a new paradigm instead or an alternative to the Neumann model where you have the memory and the CPU separated from each other. Now you try to do the processing next to where the data is stored. And this is what we call FPGA based near memory acceleration of sneak sneak. So our solution is to perform read mapping near where data resides. And we carefully redesign the accelerator logic of sneak snake to exploit near memory computation. So that is an, an, a capability or a nice feature provided by Xilinx uh, in their board, their recent board, uh, which is, um, uh, this is the board member. So you can go with uh, ultra scale boards. Most of them, they have this um, uh, high bandwidth memory or HPM. So that is located next to the FPGA logic board. So you have the chip located, not within the same, uh, either in the same package or very next to, to it. So it's different from 3D stacked memories, but these uh, memories have very high bandwidth where you can uh, fetch a huge amount of data with, uh, short, with the less latency to the FPGA logic to do the computation. So we do the comparison with another one that used um, traditional memories, DDR4, and we use Power9 IPM station to do the connection. So now when we observe the speed up, there is a huge speed up over there because you have now higher memory bandwidth, then you can fetch more data, then you can use more replications. And this is the number of replications you can have. And um, if you see compared to the CPU, we use 64 CPU threads over there, the dashed line. And this is the performance using the FPGA with the HPM. So the best performing um, uh, is with um, the red, red plot because, uh, or the green plot. It can scale very well uh, and use the connection of uh, OCAPI or this uh, framework to transfer the data from the HPM to the FPGA. Now with the energy saving, you can see the energy uh, efficiency is almost um, zero, which means it's really high. So this is um, compared to the um, 64 threads using Power9 machine. So the energy is really very high for these devices. And uh, using the FPGA with the HPM memory, you can see the energy efficiency by reducing the data movement and make everything local within the same device. So you can see the saving uh, it's, it's really uh, very high, can be up to two orders of magnitude. So near memory pre-alignment filtering improves performance and energy efficiency by 27X and 133X respectively over 16 core, that is 64 hardware threads, IPM power nine CP. So the, the performance can be increased by order of magnitude and the energy by two orders of magnitude over a CPU implementation. Of course, if we compare it to DDR4-based devices, the numbers are uh, much less, but the energy benef uh, benefits will be high, still up to orders of magnitude. These are the things that you can do with Sneak Snake. So we have now GPU, FPGA, CPU. Uh, we have also uh, the near memory FPGA acceleration. 
Um, but we're still, um, for example, lacking any implementation for upmem devices, for example, or something around these emerging technologies or the new real uh, PEM devices. Uh, recently, we got this, these chips from NVIDIA. Uh, I'm not sure if they are still available in the market or not yet, but this is very recent uh, release of H100 GPUs. And these GPUs, they have a dedicated core to build the dynamic programming matrix to do the sequence alignment on the H100 uh, GPUs. And they claim about 7x improvement in dynamic programming calculation over the A100 GPU, which is the best exists in the market. Uh, and um, we expect once we have specialized devices as in this, to uh, reduce the bottleneck or to alleviate the problem with the sequence alignment. But still, I believe, even if we have dedicated hardware to do the calculation, um, normally using a cheap filtering would always be beneficial here because if you can implement the dynamic programming in specialized hardware, I'm sure you can leverage the same hardware to do filtering while reducing the computation a bit. So this is to be investigated. Uh, someone need to do um, someone need to do evaluation or benchmarking with some of the filters on the same GPU and compare it to the dynamic programming uh, performance. So Joel said it's going to be released in the third quarter of uh, this year. Yeah, hopefully we get it soon. And then we start to do some evaluation in our group, uh, doing some uh, designs for new filters and new genome analysis applications. As I said, there are upmem uh, upmem devices that are real PEM uh, DRAM modules. So you have similar to the DDR4 you have, for example, you have the memory banks and uh, you have the DPUs, the processing elements that you can do processing near the data. So it will be interesting if someone can uh, evaluate Sneak Snake, for example, in these kind of devices. All right. As the last slide, the key conclusion here, as we always say, most speed up comes from parallelism enabled by both novel architectures and new algorithms. So you always want to have an algorithm that is aware about the hardware you are using. You also want to use the hardware that can fit or the best fit for the algorithm that you design, as we always show some examples on this. These are the pointers to study if you are curious about all these topics. Remember, we have two uh, genomics courses. They are already public online from the previous semester. And you can also watch the lectures from this semester as well. That's it for today. Uh, if you have any question, we can take them now. Otherwise, we can end the lecture. I'm not sure if we have any question on YouTube. Yeah, if not, we can end the lecture. All right, uh, have a very nice holidays for the next week. I'm not sure if you will have a lecture or not, probably not. Uh, we will uh, send you email uh, to see what we will do the next week, but probably won't have a lecture. So enjoy the holidays, stay safe, and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.